I saw that the crowd here is very diverse, which is really great, but I was wondering if maybe we can make a, small, uh, a quick hands up who actually is using Clue here in the audience. All right. Yay. That's quite a few. <laughs> That's amazing. Ida, how would you personally, we just got an introduction, but how would you personally describe the mission of Clue? What are you actually really doing? We're helping people understand what's going on in their bodies. Um, it's kind of a mystery right now to most people how the bio biology actually works. You know, when can I actually become pregnant? Why am I having these pains? What's going on with my mood? Is this birth control better for me than this birth control? So we try to help people gather data around their own bodies and use that data to help them navigate life. All right, and you are one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer in this um, industry. You started the company back in 2013 when the, wor uh, the word femtech wasn't even popular, and I think it was even you who coined that, right? So how did you come up with this word? Well, I should first of all say that I did not build Clue alone. Uh, I built Clue together with my co-founders, especially my dear husband, Hans. Uh, well, we're not married, but I still call him my husband. <laughs> um, so I came up with the term femtech um, in preparation for a, a panel I was doing at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco. And I was trying to look at these other panelists. So the panel was about female health, and I tried to see how do people describe what they do? What, use, how, what words do they use? And the language was kind of all over the place, and I thought, but hold on, I can see there is so much activity. There is a new business category on the rise, but we don't have a name. And I thought, we need a name so that we can understand that this is really a new thing that's happening. And then femtech seemed like a very natural, like we have fintech, we also need femtech. And we actually did an um, article in the Wochen which was named femtech statt fintech. So ah, really? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So looking back in your life, have you always been a pioneer? Well, thank you for calling me a pioneer. I think that's a great compliment. Um, I have tried to be a pioneer in my own life, I think, trying to figure out what do I really want to learn? What do I need to explore and kind of take in? Mm. So in that sense, I have always been kind of pushing my own boundaries, I think, of trying to be courageous and, and practice being courageous. Um, and I've always been an entrepreneur. I've had two jobs in my life. I got fired from both <laughs> after like one week and zero days. Okay. Crazy stories, okay. but it's actually true. Tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after I graduated from business school, a very creative business school, uh, I got a job as an organizational consultant, and I was meant to go to India to work at this place um, for KPMG. And there was a lot of training, a lot of like psychology tests and intelligence tests and all kinds of things with a long hiring process. And throughout that hiring process, I gave an interview to somebody. I got it clear with my boss. And then I packed all my stuff, had my farewell party to my friends, and then literally 10 o'clock at night, before I was supposed to get on a flight 6 a.m. the next morning, I get a call from a person I've never met sitting in London saying, I'm not very comfortable with you going to India. And I was like, what? <laughs> and it was a whole big weird mess up that really had very little to do with me. And I remember then going to a meeting with the guy who had hired me, and he said, you don't have corporate mindset. And I was like, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm not ever, ever going to be in a situation where somebody can do that. Or like, I was just like, duh, I'll just do my own thing. But even without corporate mindset, then you found your own company, right? So I also don't know exactly what he meant. I think it might be a very <laughs> polite way of saying that I was like uncontrollable or something. All right. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with corporations as such. I just think I like being able to shape my own work life to a large extent. And what exactly motivated you then to start a company around female health? So I think it's a mix of my own personal needs. Um, I tried to be on the pill. I had a lot of side effects in my early 20s, and I was 
Like, why is this thing about family planning so difficult? Like, you would think it's a really basic need for all of human mankind, that you would have had like a whole host of options for people to choose between. But there really wasn't that many options. And I was like, why is this? And this was, back, it was about 10 years ago. And I had this sense that people wanted less chemistry in their lives. The smartphone was coming out, so we had this supercomputer in our pockets. We had more sensors that could give us data. And I was like, what if we could collect enough data so that we could really just know what was going on in the body, and from there we would know which states to use a condom, or we would know kind of how to live our lives. So I wanted that thing. <laughs> I spoke to my friends, and they also wanted that thing. So that was kind of my own part of that. And the other part was that I have traveled all over the planet since I was an infant with my parents, They're, you know, these crazy adventurers. And so I've seen women's lives um, all over, and it, it just sat so deeply in me that when women have agency over their own bodies, then you can have, you know, kids going to school and financial independence and all the other things that you want for a more balanced world. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that you have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, basically, when medicine is trying to come up with new pills, with new cares, it's always around the male body, and often those medications, they don't really help female users. Um, why has medicine overlooked 50% of the population over the last 100 and more years? Well, there is like so many levels you can answer that question to. I mean, the first one is that it's very impractical to test on women because they have cycles. <laughs> But beyond that, it's of course, you know, a huge blind spot that our world have in many ways of, you know, not recognizing the life experience that, that women have or people with cycles have because of the biology. If you truly shape the world to actually fit women's needs, you would probably have a very different world. And for sure, you would think about it when you develop technology and when you develop medicine. And yeah. Clue wants to change this. You have 10 million users um, right now, and you raised more than 30 million US dollars from venture capitalists. And I think in your very last round, you raised 20 million. And that was one of the biggest tickets that a female entrepreneur ever got. How did that make you feel, and how did you do that? Again, I must really say I didn't do this alone. I very much did this with my co founder, Hans. Um, so, how did it make me feel? I think, and as a As an entrepreneur, you always have like the next goal. So I'm like, cool, got that done. <laughs> the next thing. So, I mean, we celebrate it, but it's also such a long process. Like from you, from somebody says, yes, we want to do it, till you actually have a term sheet, till you actually have negotiated the term sheet, till the money is actually on the bank account. You know, <laughs> so like, when do you actually take the champagne out? Um, but of course, it felt good. And again, the reason why it feels good is because it enables us to do this work that we do because we want to make have an impact in the world. Um, so for me, it's always about how can we keep having the privilege to do what we do for our users. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just one of these necessities on the journey. More, it's not a goal in itself to raise money. Mm. It's what keeps us going. And what gives us the freedom to create the kind of business that we want over time and don't have to be too hard pressed to for instance, make money too soon. Still, I think you are even a pioneer here. You know, uh, women have more difficulties raising money. They get less money. They get less funding all in all. So do you have any advice for maybe female entrepreneurs that might be here in the audience how to raise money? It's hard. Just keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> get advice from people that have done it before. Find somebody and have them help you. Ask for help. That would be my best advice. So who helped you? A lot of people helped us. So many people helped us. Our angel investors helped us. Um, people who are entrepreneurs that have gone further than us on the journey helped us. Um, lots of blog posts and podcasts and books. And like, it's a steep learning curve. I mean, I've, we've, we've been at it for a while and we've you know, had to learn all the time too. And you know, we're never done. Like you, I mean, maybe someday we will be done, but that sense of like, you have to keep learning, you have to keep understanding what group of investors are you talking to now because the stage has changed. So the people you got to know a year ago is not really relevant anymore. So it's a constant you know, process of being on it. But I think actually, honestly, having a male co-founder was really helpful. Why? I have to say that. 
Why was it helpful? It's because you think it's a numbers game to raise money. You, you think you're going to have a business conversation. And to some extent, that is true. But there's also a huge part of it, which is a social game. And it is a man's game. Um, and navigating that game is hard as a woman, because you are, per default, a disruption. <laughs> like, you'll, you'll walk into the room, you'll, you'll be the only woman there, you know, something shifts in the room, or you're at that dinner, you're the only woman there, it's a different conversation. So, so I somehow felt that my partner could a little bit more kind of fish in water, navigate that social game. Um, but I think the combination was powerful. I don't also think he could have raised money alone. Like, I think, you know, it, it was a team effort. So I think that's maybe a good thing to think about. Like, who's, you know, what team are we raising money? Not just the one pitching in the room, but also, you know, at home, um, if you have the, you know, if you have a team that can help, you know, Having a data scientist around was really important for us because we constantly needed to give them new numbers and analysis of different things. And actually, it was really funny because for our Series A, we brought our data scientist along to San Francisco to babysit our newborn baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that he was just like so crucial to actually make that work because we could be really fast with answers to investors. I see. I think we get your motivation, we get your business idea, and I have been following Clue for quite a while, and um, as you just mentioned, you are doing a lot of things. It's not only the app, you have video tutorials, you have ambassadors, you have really a big community, you have your own little festivals. What you don't have is you don't charge any money for it, so I'm really wondering where is your business model? Hmm. Did you say where is your business model or where yes. is your business mind? <laughs> <laughs> model first. <laughs> um, well, fundamentally, maybe I'll a a answer what I thought you asked about the mind, because when I started thinking about this, I really wanted it to be a business and not a nonprofit. And the reason being is that I think there is so much drive and energy in having a business model. Because, you know, in the end, I'd love every woman on this planet to be able to know what's going on in their body. And to really get out there, I think having a business model is a really great driver. Mm. We had a goal to first build a user base. We have reached our 10 million active user mark. So for now, it's, you know, the next goal is to find out how do we make enough money that we can keep going. Um, not necessarily maximize profit, because we are in a long game here. Um, and for us, it's crucial that we find ways to make money that feels super aligned with our vision and our values. So we are making experiments, um, and we're still learning. And we have the privilege, because we raise this money, we still have money on the bank account, that we can take the time it needs to get this right. And will there be anything coming up soon, or will you continue we like might. this? Might. We might. All right, so stay tuned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, is, well, you are often saying that your goal also is not only to build a business, but to build an ethical business. So how do you personally define an ethical business? Because everyone wants to build an ethical business. I've never heard someone say, I want to build an unethical business. Mm, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that one. I hear very few people say, I want to build an ethical business. I hear a lot of people say, I want to build a big business. And I wish more people would say, I want, of course, to build an ethical business. Um, so. I think it can be a very subjective thing, what that means. But for me, it's about having alignment between what you believe in, what are your values, what's your vision, and then doing things that feels right. Like, can you look your users in the eyes and explain them exactly where their data is going and feel good about it? And then what do you do? Is it, are these three things actually aligned? If they're in alignment, I might disagree with you what your ethics are, but if you're clear about what you think is right, you're doing what you're saying, and you're transparent about it. As a user, I can choose. The problem with a lot of tech companies is that they're, they're built on lack of transparency. If people truly understand how Facebook is making money or Google is making money, would they still choose the service? They might, and then it's fine. <laughs> but this lack of transparency, I think, is a huge problem because you know, you start having this feeling creep up that 
something is icky, you don't really trust technology, or you don't really trust Silicon Valley companies, or you know, this sense of like something is a little off. And for me, that's a problem because I think that data is this superpower that we have, you know, that we now have. And figuring ways, figuring out ways to actually make this truly work for the user is such a key thing. And right now, having this negative connotation makes us lose out kind of double because first, the people who don't give a they will use data for whatever, and the people who are more mindful of users' interests, they might shy away from using data, and then we have lost twice, <laughs> right? So, But would you say that people are really losing trust in the big companies such as Facebook and Google? I think most of us here in the audience are on Twitter and on Facebook, and there's this debate, but still you don't see it, people really go to action, you know? It's just they talk and they say they're they might have lost trust. So what is your experience there? I think there is a learning, collective learning going on in society right now where we're starting to understand, like, what is data? What can it even do? What happens when we have AI in all areas of our lives? And oh, by the way, who builds this technology? Who makes decision about this? And why don't I have agency over my data? So I think there's a huge education that has to happen till so there's a point where people say, actually, Mm, if I could choose between option A and B, and option B gives me agency, I'll go for B. Right now, there are very few B options. <laughs> um, and we have huge monopolies that are very hard to challenge, but not impossible. And I, I'm pretty hopeful that over time, people will choose to go for companies that they truly trust. You are collecting health data, which is very critical. It's not just a picture that you upload on, on Facebook or Twitter. So why should people trust you? Why should people trust the people behind Clue? They shouldn't per default. Absolutely not. They should look carefully. They should read our terms of service. They should see how we think about content, they should think about our business model. They will, they, will they understand your terms of services when they Yes, we have made such an effort that they're actually readable. I'm very proud of them. You should really read them. <laughs> they're very educational even about how data flows. Um, so I think, I think people are smart and they pick up on small cues. And when you build a business, you make a trillion decisions every single day. And you know, are all these decisions actually in integrity? Do they line up? You know, you cannot say that you want to, you know, do something helpful for women in the planet and then have shitty maternity leave policies. You know, it doesn't work. Like, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta walk the talk. You know. So what do you do to walk the talk? Well, I think it starts with having a really clear why. Like, why are we building this? And when we have a clear why, then that also makes people attracted to Clue who shares the why. And then you have a shared value community, you know? We care about the same things. And then from there, it becomes a natural. How should we write content? Well, we should write it in a way that feels really inclusive. We should write it in a way that doesn't feel like we're talking down to people. Like, you know, it becomes the DNA, it becomes who you are. And you make all these little choices. And, and I think that's, that's how you become clear to the user. That's, and then people can be like, I see what clue is. I choose it or I choose something else. But it's fine. And if I choose Clue, what happens to my data? What are you doing with my data there? So right now, it's really simple. We do two things with the data. We help people understand their bodies, and we help move science forward. Again, it's very clearly stated in the terms of service. So I think it's really important to help advance female health research, because the data set we have now is something that the planet has never seen before. It's a really unique thing that we have, and I feel a huge sense of responsibility. Like, we're sitting on this thing that could potentially really accelerate research. And research is something that should benefit all people on the planet. So I think, you know, this, it's, it's a giving, and I'm really happy to, to feel that our user community support that sentiment. Like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm happy that my data can go and we can learn more about the body, as long as, of course, it's anonymized and all of that. So, so that's the two things we do with data. 
Um, I think right now we are at an interesting um, in turning point because up till now it was startups like you and you have some competitors who are in this business and all of a sudden the big behemoths are stepping in like Google. Um, Google wants to really go big in health tech. Mm. Um, how does that make you feel? How will you survive in this new landscape, this more fiercey? So first of all, I think it's a really big positive that some of the big tech companies put their attention to health. I mean, health is a massive global task. Like we're, you know, you know, we're trying to do something over here, but then there's all the rest. So a lot of people need to work on health. Um, I don't feel threatened because I think to address the need that people with cycles have, you have to have a lot of gifu. Like you have to really understand women's lives. And I think if you are Google, you have a lot of things to care about and think about. And, you know, I, I feel we have a real advantage of being kind of so close to our users. And, um, and in the end, if we fail because somebody else did an even better job and solved the problem, you know what? Then our vision came true anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, we do everything we can to be successful, of course. But in the end, we do this because we want to have this thing exist in the world. So you, you do have a plan B? Is this what you're saying? Me, personally, yeah. plan B? Oh, I have a lot of things I could do in my life that I don't do at the moment. I'm, don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where do your values come from? You talked a little bit about your parents. It seems like um, it was a very like a hippiesque family. You were driving on your parents' motorbikes on the back all through the United States um, to Brazil. Did that give you values in life? Where do you... Get your values from. I sat in the front, actually, of okay. my mom, and we went all <laughs> over the planet. Yes, of course, you get values from your parents. Um, you get good stuff and bad stuff, and as an adult, it's your responsibility to, you know, figure out <laughs> what you do with what you got. Um, where does values come from? Maybe I can't exactly answer that question, but maybe somewhere around. So at Clue, we put a lot of emphasis into kind of personal growth for ourselves as founders to kind of keep racing with the challenge, um, but also for the, for the whole team. Um, so we have learning budgets, we have offsides, we have trainers, teachers, buddy choosers, all kind of things to really help people be on this journey of personal growth. And I feel that as you kind of walk that, you know, as you go on that journey of trying to grow yourself as a human, that's where you figure out what your values are or so I, I guess values is something that kind of, I don't know, comes from somewhere deep inside. I can't really get closer, but. All right. Um, yeah. You've come a really long way from zero to 10 million users to being one of the pioneers in this business. But if you look ahead, what is your vision for Clue in 10 years? What do you want to have accomplished by then? Mm. I think one of the challenges for people right now is that it's a really fragmented experience of managing your health and your health data. So I think there's a huge opportunity in building a, a larger ecosystem around femtech. And I'd love to clue to, you know, to be building that. Um, there, is so, there is so much unmet need in female health. I mean, it's, it's just, it, keeps expanding on me every day. I'm like, oh, we got to do something here. So if I have the privilege to keep being kind of in the game <laughs> to, to support people with understanding their bodies, you know, in, in so many different ways, then I'm happy. All right. So you won't uh, let Google just steal away all your business? Say that again. You won't let Google just steal away all this um, health tech business. In the end, users decide. You know, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can of creating real value through what we do, and, and then users make the decision. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are running out of time, and we have some questions on Slido. Maybe we can show them. Okay, so we have talked about this already, what happens to the data that the users uh, generate, and again, how are you going to earn money in the I future? I can say a little bit about how to earn money. I, my core thing is that I think users, um, I think it's important to have a user-facing business model 
because it's part of the trust building. People need to understand how we make money. It needs to be, it needs to be just super obvious for anybody that picks up and uses the product. And for me, that means having a user-facing model. If you have a model where you, know, you think we're in a one-to-one -one relationship, but then actually how I make money is because there's all these other people in the relationship that you don't really know about, doesn't fly. Like it gotta be there. So, so that's like a core, a core thing. And that means because there's a question also: Is it a model to have health insurance pay for a premium access? Um, that would be a third party involved. Would that be something that? Well, you might I think consider? again the key is you know make that a possibility for users. Say, hey, would you be interested in looping in your insurance company and have? something going on between you and the insurance company, we can facilitate the conversation. And if users are cool with that, I'm cool with that. But it's right. got to be their choice. There's one question that I really love and that I want to ask you as a last question. Do you have suggestions for bringing menstrual awareness to men in the workplace? <laughs> so, I would say what I have experienced the last 10 years is that most men, like almost all men, really want to understand what is it that women go through? What is their life experiences? Because they also feel some of the symptoms, right? <laughs> so <laughs> men want to, it's like this closed world. And honestly, for most women, it's also a closed world. Like, what is this thing? Maybe they even try to like, oh, I don't, don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to ignore it. <laughs> so helping men understand is a huge part of what we do. It's kind of how we think about writing stuff that anybody would be able to read and feel, you know, I'm invited to this conversation. We have a feature in Clue that's called Clue Connect where somebody having cycles can choose to share a high level data set with a trusted person. Um, but I think looping in the men is like a key, key thing. This is not a build for women by women product. This is built for the world by a diverse team. Thank you very much. I think that's a very nice statement for the end of this talk. And there are lots of men here, so I think Thank your you. message is out there. Thank you, Ida. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.